What's up? It's Way Up with Angela Yee. I'm Angela Yee, and you know it's a Wealth Wednesday, so my partner Stacey Tisdale is here. Happy Wealth Wednesday. We are taking you way up with Cedric Nash, mm-hmm. a.k.a. your millionaire mentor today. Yes, you're also the founder of the Black Wealth Summit, which I've been to. Yes. You know, yes. fortunately, great uh, space to be in. I actually have made a lot of great connections there, too, who I still keep in touch with. Oh, good. Who yeah. Still, oh, that's good. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. So I appreciate that. And you're also an author. Why should white guys have all that. the wealth? you got to love, love the title of this book. So, um, And as soon as you open this book, you find out why you called it that, right? So oh, let's yes. t- let's talk Original about those numbers. Lewis. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, you know, giving a shout out to the, to the Reginald Lewis, who wrote a book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun. I read his book years ago and was incredibly inspired by it. And so I had to give him credit in the book. Um, and also, you know, give credit to his family as well because he gave us insights as to what was possible in business, and I wanted to give us as a community what's possible in building wealth. So, so yeah, it was really, really a, a great call. And then when I when I finished the book, it was almost like you know, I was talking to a friend and I said, "Why should only white people getting rich be getting rich in America?" Mm-hmm. Like I was on a rant, and then I said, "Ooh, that could be a title." And then I was like, maybe <laughs> I should title Why Should White Guys Have All the Wealth? But then it's like trying to sing the national anthem behind Whitney Houston. You kind of don't touch certain things. <laughs> but it just made sense. I had right. to go for that. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to um, someone who works up here when they saw the title of this book. And we were just having a conversation about um, how to build wealth. And he was saying, well, you know, I, I, I think the way to do it is for me to um, get a life insurance and then borrow against it. And I was like, no, (laughs) please don't think that's the way that you're going to build wealth. You simplified it with the stock, real estate, private equity, repeat. But how does somebody who's sitting at home making maybe $50,000 a year even relate to that? Well, how they relate to it is the same way that my grandmother did, who bought a house in the Bronx for $25,000 while she was only making $200 a month working at a cleaner's. And so by the time she died, that house was paid for, Mm -hmm. and she had $43,000 saved up. She only made $200 a month. She had less than an eighth grade education. She just saved her money and lived below her means, and she paid $13,000 for her funeral arrangements when she died, and $30,000 she left to her grandkids, of which I received $10,000, and I turned that $10,000 into millions by investing in the stock market, creating a business, investing in real estate, and by the way, I still own my grandmother's house in the Bronx. And it's worth what now? It's worth about $700,000. It's a two-family over in the Laconia section, two blocks from the projects. And I get calls all the time asking me, do I want to sell that that piece of property? You know, So I had to buy it out of a reverse mortgage because my grandfather took a reverse mortgage out of it. And that's mm-hmm. another conversation that we <laughs> as a community need to have Definitely. because because it could have easily gone back to the investor. But since I'm an investor, I'm like, no, it's coming back to me. Now, let's talk about you and how you managed to develop a millionaire mindset, because a lot of times, and like Stacey was saying, if you have $50,000, then how do you figure out how can I invest in the stock market and how can I own real estate and how can I do those things? But a lot of that is also how you develop a millionaire mindset. So give us those components. Well, you know, in my book, I talk about three things. It's that's developing a millionaire mindset, adopting millionaire values, and making what I call millionaire money moves. And millionaire money moves is, in, in essence... The things that you do to invest in assets that appreciate and generate income over time. But it takes the mindset and the value set that allows you to be consistent enough to have impact. It takes a long time to build wealth. And what people are missing is the fact that they think they could do it faster. Mm -hmm. And they look at their friend, they're saying, wow, they're driving a nice car, they got a nice lifestyle, they must be doing something different than me. And and, and, And it's going too slow. And then they change their game plan. So I, I developed my mindset through my mentorship, and that's really how it's done. I had the privilege of having four millionaire mentors who poured into me since 11th grade out of high school, and they were invested in banks, and they bought apartment buildings, and they had land that was uh, that they used for a winery. One was, an, uh, was a consultant, inspired me to become to create a consulting firm. And so these guys poured into me, and just watching them, watching their moves kind of inspired me. So when I came out of college after reading a lot of books on personal finance, I, I kind of spent my entire life thinking, how am I going to turn this meager thirty-six thousand four hundred dollars 
a year as a software engineer into millions, and I devised a plan, and that's really what I wrote in the book. I want to ask you, uh, so for a couple of things that you said there, right? You talk about having mentors who poured into you, and at one point in this book, you discuss uh, a plan that you had that was terrible, but your <laughs> your mentor was like, this is amazing, you know, you're very yes. creative, and sometimes people feel like you have to be brutally honest and be like, this is terrible, but you said the opposite because it could have really deflated you. Oh, I learned so much from that, and now when young men or young women come to me with ideas that I don't think that are that great. You know, it it happened to me one day, and I stopped. I said, before I basically, you know, step on this this guy's dreams, right? You know, let me inspire them. Let me tell them that, hey, you know, I believe the world should tell you no. You just never know. You might be, you know, you you may, I mean, we don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And just because we're successful as entrepreneurs and have done a lot, doesn't mean that we know everything. And so I think that a lot of times our young people their their excitement is is uh, is hampered down because of our own interpretation of our own capabilities and inabilities. Yeah, imagine if he would have told you that, and then it could have made you take a whole different path. I'm telling you, at that time I was I was a basketball player. I thought I had the kind of skills that was going to get me a scholarship, make it to the NBA. And this guy changed my life. He made me feel like I was brilliant, mm-hmm. you know, because I started studying engineering, started taking physics. And the idea just made no sense whatsoever, <laughs> right? It was like a solar panel or something. It's like, yeah, a solar panel, but it was like plugged up with lights, which kind of negated the whole concept. Yeah, it's of, not really. A, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like, it just, it just made no sense. But <laughs> Gus knew this, and Gus just said, wow, I think you're really under something. He got really excited about it and made me think <laughs> that I was under excited. something. And I love that because, like I said, it's like, you know, what he knew is that he knew that, you know, that I was at that stage of my life where I needed that kind of inspiration. Mm-hmm. And so I think that. But it, like I said, I don't do that anymore. I don't create, you know, bad contraptions. But I have <laughs> created a business starting from the bottom that does ninety million in revenue with three hundred employees, and so I did figure out a way how to build wealth. And so that was very pivotal in my in my development. And that's the second, important. Uh, what you were saying, how you got encouragement. Yes. At the right time. Yes. And I w- want you to really break down what does a smart plan look like because we talk conceptually everybody needs a plan you right. know you have to have a plan you have to have a plan but again when i'm sometimes if i'm sitting here listening to this i'm like okay what what's that mean right so in your book you say the most important thing to do is to start but what should what are some tangible steps people can take to create a wealth plan well i think the first thing they really have to do is and i talk about it in my book they got to know where they're starting from they mm-hmm. got to know their net worth they got to know how much uh, how much cash they have available what what assets do they have what income producing assets they have now most people aren't going to have much wealth they may have negative wealth they may not have any 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 assets but the name of the game is to know where you're starting from. But I have another thing in my book that talks about mapping out their end game. Yeah. It's almost like the start with the end in mind. And so I came up with that end game for myself. And I'll share with you guys, I talk about it in my book, what I wanted. I wanted a million dollars in income without having to work, of which I wanted half a million to come from my cash, the other half to come from my real estate. And so now I had, now knowing that and knowing what I have and knowing what income my, my real estate gives me now, now I can develop a roadmap that says, okay, what properties do I need to buy that's going to give me more income and grow over time? And how do I get my cash up? So you kind of have to start with understanding where you are, where you need to be, or where you want to be, and then building a roadmap to get there. My book lays it out. You teach Yeah, it yeah. lays it out. It's, it's the funny thing is I'm here mm-hmm. in New York, but yeah, I bought my first multifamily property was in Jersey City. Mm-hmm. And I paid three hundred sixty thousand dollars. Jersey for City this. is booming. It's I used booming. to I used to actually live in Jersey City too. Yeah. And it's such a I mean, it, it's really nice, but it has been absolutely incredible. Well that building's worth two two million dollars. Mm. And I get calls about it all the time and I'm gonna tear it down and turn it into twenty five salon studios, twelve apartment units, and a rooftop apartment for myself. But the whole point is, is like, yo, know, styling. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it was a long, it was a journey, and there yeah. were there were days when I felt like, man, this thing is not going to happen. That's why I'm so passionate about this, about teaching people and mentoring people to stay the course. Mm-hmm. That it's a long journey of getting there, and we're starting often from behind. But you've just got to believe in the process. Steve Jobs says this so eloquently. He says you can't see the dots, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to believe in something to keep connecting the dots. And so that's exactly how it feels when you're saving in that one stock and it's now we're in a down period within the stock market or you're buying that multifamily or that duplex and it just feels like the appreciation's not happening. It's the same experience that everyone experiences. 
You just have to stay encouraged and stay, stay, stay connected. Now, back to what you said earlier. Let's look back at this, right? You're, uh, you bought this Mercedes, yeah. and you discuss this in the book, and you talk about depreciating assets, but you can learn from that because sometimes we do things. We look around. We see people driving incredible cars. We see people with nice bags, nice shoes, jewelry, and all of those things. So what lesson did you learn when you drove that car off the lot? You know, the, the lesson I learned, it was interesting because I talk about this process of transforming your mindset and your values. And when I say values, you, you know, values is another word by saying priorities. A lot of the reasons why people money uh, situation is not bad, not not are, are, are not that great is because their priorities are centered around looking wealthy versus being actually wealthy. When your values are centered around being wealthy, then you start doing things that, you know, that align with that. So when I bought that car, I still have that car, believe it or not. It sits in my house in St. <laughs> Petersburg. I just look at it every once in a while. The interior looks brand spanking new. And it's a 2002. But that, you know, that, car, it was a, it, that car signified me transforming my values. Because what happened was I'd been working on, I'd been, I'd been doing a lot of good things right. But when I bought that car in 2002, it just didn't sit right with me. And I didn't even call my accountant. I just, and I had money in the bank. I was living in a, five, in a $2 million house in, in, in Oakland Hills, California. My business was doing well. Something you know, didn't sit right. And it was because my values were changing. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I should have bought a, I should have bought a multifamily property as opposed to buying this $102,000 car, right? Because if my business crap uh, fell, uh, collapsed, I had no sustainable income. But if the funny thing about that, Angela, is that that property I was telling you about in Jersey mm -hmm. City, I bought that in October 2003. It's paid for in October 2023. I had a 20-year mortgage. I bought another one in D.C. in November of 2003. In 2004, I bought another one in New Jersey. That was that signifies how my values had changed. Right. It's I wasn't buying up. fly yeah. clothes. I wasn't. I just kept my old cars. I was taking every piece of cash I had that I could create from my business, and I was investing in assets. And I'm telling you now, at the age of 58, you know, from you know when I was the age of 38, I'm glad I made that priority shift because <laughs> it makes a big difference. Because sometimes it's hard too, and I, o I always feel like when you have a goal in mind, like right now for me, and Stacy knows, I bought a 30 unit um, building in Midtown I'm so Detroit. Proud of her for doing this, it. by the way. Yeah, and. I've had to make some sacrifices now in order to be able to make that happen. Yep. But when you are making those sacrifices and you know why, and you're like, okay, when this is done, you know, let me map out. Because no matter what, it's not going to be a loss for me, right? right? And so, well, now that I'm much older than you, I mean, you, I, I'm, you, you can look at me and see how that, how that, trans, how that translates years down the line. I mean, you get those rent increases over the years, and you keep that building going on, even though you might go through ups and downs. And it pays off handsomely. It really does. And then you're getting rent, but then at some point, if you feel like selling the building you as you're paying it up, that. you always have that yeah. to be able to do. Because I've, you know, real estate has been great for me um, also. Mm -hmm. And so it's good for me to know. And you talk about paying things off, even like putting a down payment, right? Yep. Because I was like horrified by PMI. <laughs> and I didn't learn about that until I bought my first house. I didn't know what mortgage insurance was. Mm -hmm. And I had a realtor who was encouraging me to just buy. Um, you can just put 10% down, don't worry about it. And then I got another realtor, and that's who I use to this day. And she was like, well, you'll have to pay mortgage insurance. You should put down more money because it's kind of a waste, right. you know, insuring this mortgage. And so I did that. And moving forward, I wouldn't not put down, I wouldn't not put down enough to not have to pay mortgage insurance. I right. just feel like that's not a great idea. But I've had people who were going to buy their first property, trying to get a hard money loan and do things like that because their credit isn't where it should be or they don't have the money. And I don't necessarily think you're in the best position to buy a house if you have to do those things. Right. Also, there's a there's this thing about when you when you practice that discipline or that when you transition your values around there and take your time, you just feel more empowered. Mm -hmm. In 2007, 2008, when we had the big the Great Recession, you know, I live in, in Maryland part time in Prince George's County. There's a large number of people who lost their houses because they were able to get these subprime loans. But what was so sad about these subprime loans, if you look at the research, a lot of them were forced into subprime loans who were qualified for conforming loans Ooh. because they just did they not didn't understand have, it. They didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have so the many, knowledge. Wow, that's crazy. I remember right. speaking to someone who that happened to, and she's like, well, the broker should have, you know, this person should have told me. That's not their job 
to tell you to do that. But there are certain it banks. It kind of is. Who, but, right? wait, but not, there are not, certain, the, not the oh. broker, I'm sorry, the, more, the lender. The lender. Right. But there are certain lenders, but there are lenders that intentionally did that to our oh, community. It was a highly, That's highly, awful. highly they got intentional. Sued. Yeah. It was a highly yeah. intentional thing, but I, I want people to know that you can only be taken advantage of if you walk in there not knowing. Yeah, there's too many what, resources yeah, available. A lot of people didn't even understand adjust, what adjustable rate mortgages were. Then right. all of a sudden they were caught off guard. And that's that's the, the yeah. woman who told me, well, I didn't understand what that meant. And I said, you, you can only be taken advantage of to the point where you're not educated. When you're making these huge investments, it is important to do your own research and get education. Absolutely. You know the most important thing is to have what I call a millionaire mentor. Somebody who's not in it to make money, somebody who only wants you to succeed. I talk about in chapter nine about how to find a millionaire mentor. Mm-hmm. It's so important to have people that you can trust that are that have no, no, n- nothing in the game, right? right? No horse in the race, uh, because now you know you're getting an authentic answer. And the reality is, we have them in our community. You just got to search through our fraternities, our, our sororities, our churches to find these people that are knowledgeable that will help you for for just for free. And so, um, because like I said, there's a lot of people who are presenting like they're experts, but they're basically trying to make money off of the transaction. And you don't, you can't sometimes feel like you're getting an authentic answer from that. And the sad reality is, is that, like I said, you know, we, we give our government a hard time because we think they're not doing enough to close the racial wealth gap or to help our community out. So they create programs like they did to lower the requirements to get housing. Mm-hmm. But then on our side, the intentional side, we're not doing the work on our side so that we can take advantage of these programs right. responsibly. But it's largely because we don't have access to people that are really going to give us the authentic information without anything in it. Putting this into context, context though, a lot of the people that we speak to and the way we talk about being a millionaire, mm-hmm. it sounds like an aspiration. Oh, I want to be a millionaire to be a millionaire. Mm-hmm. You have to be a millionaire even to live. To be able to retire to one be day. able to retire. <laughs> exactly. Talk about that. And I also, yep. real estate, I have two and to rental have your properties. Community. I love real estate. Blessing for those. Let's talk about some stocks. Exactly. To getting people in, you know, the stock market. We're, um, we talk about a lot. Blacks are the first time, big, largest group of first time investors in the stock market. Yeah. But we have to all put our money to work because if you don't have a million dollars, what were, I was reading some of your formulas. A million dollars would get you, what, 40000 40000 yeah. Using the 4% uh, mm-hmm. rule for withdrawals. Like if you had a million dollars in your, what I call freedom fund, which is all your money together. Assuming that you're earning an average 6% return adjusted for inflation, you could take 4% out of your freedom fund. So if you had a million dollars, that means that you have $40,000 to live on potentially for 30 to 40 years. If you had $2 million, now you're talking about $80,000. If you had $3 million, you're talking about $120,000. But that's in today's money, mm-hmm. right? With inflation. So if you're 22 years <laughs> old, I just did a speech at Bowie State uh, a couple of days ago. If you're 22 years old and you're going to retire 43 years from now, that 120,000 is equivalent to 300,000. So you're going to need 8.6 million dollars if you're 22 years old to retire on the equivalent of 120,000 today. So it's a serious thing. So I don't write this book trying to make money or trying to bring attention to myself. We are in a serious state and nobody's coming to save us because where we are financially is not our fault, but it's our responsibility to fix it. And so we as a community have to pull our resources together. We have to leverage the $1.8 trillion in spending power and turn some of that into investment power and fix it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the government's, it's the government's fault. They're, they're at fault for where we are. It's slavery's fault. But they ain't going to do anything about it. Right. So we've got to do what we can to do about it. We've got to get busy investing because investing takes time. What about politics, right? How important is politics when it comes to finances? I'm looking at how in Florida now the NAACP has said that... Um, it's a travel advisory for black Americans to go to Florida because it's hostile mm-hmm. toward us. We see what the governor, Ron DeSantis, is doing there. But a lot of people have purchased property there because of the tax breaks that you're able to get. You might say it's a good investment because I bought this property here and the value of it will continue to increase. What are your thoughts when it comes to investing in places that you may not morally align with the leadership there? Right. Yeah, I I completely understand the sentiment of the NAACP. I mean, I happen to own three properties in 
And a yacht. In, and a yacht. Uh, in my <laughs> when do I get to use this yacht? Wherever you that's come down, I've been saying, when are you coming down? <laughs> so, right, but that's an investment. It really is. I mean, you get a $500,000 tax deduction in the first year you buy it. Just loads of deductions as a charter company. But but the point is is that I get their concern. Mm-hmm. And 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 I'm not a big fan of uh, of the governor at all. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a longstanding and will always be a, de- a, Demo- a, par- a person of the Democratic Party. Uh, but, the, but the reality is, is that the government can only do but so much. And, and we have to, you know, it would probably be, in my mind, better if the NAACP partners with us to kind of find ways to educate our community and not just educate. We've got to work on this mindset piece mm. because the education, you know, that's why I call it wealth literacy. Financial right. literacy makes you, makes you knowledgeable. Wealth right. literacy makes you wealthy. And so the difference is wealth literacy teaches you how to buy those assets that appreciate and accumulate and make you wealthy, how to manage the properties, how to do the things that you're doing, whereas financial literacy gives us a lot of the foundations of financial information. So we've got to, as a community, just kind of bind together because the politics are always going to be the politics. Right. And Ron DeSantis won't be in office forever, right? He won't be in office forever, but the bigger issue is the fact that that you know these political stunts and these political decisions are impacting our community significantly because we don't have wealth, we don't have power, and and we get ignored because we get completely ignored. I'm sorry to go on my soapbox because we don't have what I what they used to call in economics the dollar votes. Mm-hmm. We don't have the dollars right. that move politics. Right, because that's what it's about. The that's money, it's about. the empowerment to be able to say this is what our group needs and exactly. we'll put our money behind this candidate if we can get X, Y, and Z. But that's why the Jewish and community is so to, strong. Yeah, they have a lot of they have a they have a lot of political base. That's why the LGBT community is so strong. They have political power mm-hmm. because they invest in those things that lobby on their behalf. So the answer is not to move out of Florida or avoid it. The right. answer is the answer to is work is within to what it. the system is now to change it. Exactly. It's to basically build wealth and control your politics. I talk about that in my book, is mm-hmm. that when you have more black millionaires, right, now they have more money to invest in politics and demand change. And if you don't demand, if you don't give us the change that we're looking for in terms of the police chiefs and the police, the policing process and system and rules. If you don't, we're going to not we only, support you. we're not going to not vote for you. We're not going to support your campaign. Right. And we'll get our right. own person. And we'll get our own person. But <laughs> to, now what yeah. they do is they go in front of the black church and they play the saxophone and they act cool and hip and they, and the preachers tell us to vote for them and then they get in and then we don't see them again until, mm-hmm. t- until it's time for them to run for office again because they know that we're not going to give them any money to help their campaign. But if we, basically withheld our vote and our money, now we've got power. And so that's what we have to do as a community. We've got to pull our resources together and and really start building some serious wealth and economic might and use wealth as a weapon for for fighting discrimination and oppression as opposed to you know marching and, 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 and thinking that that's going to change. The real game changer here has been technology. We mm-hmm. talked about that, how... Um, fintech companies have, have made entry easy yep. for the black community. And what's not, the narrative that's not being told, particularly in mainstream media outlets, is there is a tremendous amount of wealth in the black community. And it's just and getting smarter about it and being collective. And to your point, using, you know, social media is the real game changer here. Jeez. I remember when um, banks... I think it was after Dodd Frank legislation, and they were, you know, working so hard to get the big banks to reduce their fees. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, con- congressional hearings every day. One girl on social media in California, I can't remember her name, challenged all of the big banks, uh, challenged people to pull their money out of big banks on that Saturday mm-hmm. and put their money in credit unions because mm-hmm. she was just fed up with the fees and she started on social media. Wow. So many hundreds of thousands of people did that that the major banks the following Tuesday dropped their fees. Yeah. So this is uh, this is understanding our collective power. Look at what happened with GameStop. Oh yeah. People, I mean, we just we have the tools to be that voice now exactly. and to start these campaigns and to make real change and we have them. I'm 100% in agreement with you. And I, like I said when I go and give my speeches, I talk about us taking not just our money but our influence. Right? We have, we have a significant influence. amount of influence. We're the it's ones that make lot. everything. Exactly. Popular. We make everything cool. Yeah. We, we add the cool factor 
to a lot of things. And so we just have to apply it appropriately. And unfortunately, because white guys have all the wealth, 84% of wealth is in uh, is in white households and 4% is in, black, in black households. Yeah. yeah, my book is not about black or white. It's about how African-Americans can build wealth despite the odds. But the whole point is because they have such an economic advantage due to the advantage they got from slavery in the whole nine yards, that now they can buy our influence, mm -hmm. right? We can't even afford our own influence, right? right? So it's just it's just a matter of what it is, but we do have a lot of influence and we do have to leverage it for for, for the good of our community. Now let's go back to this yacht for a second. <laughs> We, we're, coming, we're going to, back to this yacht. Oh, I love it. <laughs> All right, so talk to me, because people, I've heard this, and I, I don't know anything about mm -hmm. yachts, but people have always acted like that is not a great investment. Now, tell us why having a yacht, as a person who is uh, an owner of a yacht and, and somebody who is very economically savvy, and exactly. we're talking about investing, why is that a good investment for you? Well, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book is that you can have anything, but you can't have everything. And so it's a matter of how you buy them and when you buy them. And in my book, I, I make room for people to buy some nice things that they want in their life. Mm -hmm. It's called deferred gratification. Right. You achieve a particular goal. Now you reward yourself With responsibly. With your passive money. Exactly. <laughs> so you, you, you reward yourself responsibly because you can't, no one wants to save all the time. That's not much of a party. Right. But the reality is, is that with yachts, you know, there's a tax code that allows you to have a $500,000 tax deduction in the first year that you actually buy it. $500,000 deduction. If you consider, so it has to be, I think, $2 million or less that you buy that you buy the, the yacht for, and you get a $500,000 deduction in your first year if you create a charter company. So I've created a charter company. It's called Ecstasy Yacht Charters. Uh, and so my charter company, and then all the expenses on the boat, are a, you're able to write those off as well. Mm -hmm. So I have a charter, so I charter it out for people who want to come visit and hang out uh, on the yacht down in, in, in Miami. And that income that comes in or that revenue comes in is offset by its expenses. But the interesting about yachts are they are expensive. I mean, yeah, you're going to spend, to maintain yeah, you're gonna spend yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, my yacht probably costs about $200,000 a year just to maintain it, right? So, But you can earn enough money in income to cover those costs and mm -hmm. make a little bit of a profit. Right. So that's what I call ball hardening for a lifetime, not You're just You're like, a I season. love my yacht. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm keeping no, it. I'll right. rent it out. I'll do it. whatever. Yeah. yeah, but if you can make it an economic <laughs> thing, and that's really how you try to do things. You buy things economically, <laughs> right? But you'd be surprised, like super, super wealthy people in Miami have 100, 200 foot yachts, and they charter them, mm -hmm. right? They charter Absolutely. them all. They charter their planes. They charter all of that Who stuff. Who was I looking at? I was looking at somebody's... Um, what do they say? Their five hundred million dollar yacht that they have. Ooh, I can't remember who it was, but they were just showing them on their yacht. I was like, yeah. "Ooh, imagine that!" Yes. <laughs> they should be on Wealth Wednesdays. And then you see Beyonce <laughs> and Jay Z just bought a house in Malibu. They said two hundred million dollars yeah. yeah. cash. Yeah, cash. exactly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's just you know thinking out there. You know, the rich get all these advantages from the government and the whole tax breaks. You know, and, democratic. Yeah. Republican argument is that we don't tax the rich enough. It's not that. People have to realize investment income is not taxed the at same the same way, way exactly. that the income that we make at our jobs are. That's why you want to get your money into investment income. Yeah, yeah. I never forget because I remember when Mitt Romney was running against uh, Barack Obama, they were talking about how he, um, how he you know, basically only paid $20 million in taxes on like $250 million in net worth. And so, you know, at the time, I'm not sure if it was LeBron or somebody else. He made twenty million in income off of two hundred fifty thousand in net worth, and he only paid twenty percent taxes. And so, I think at the time, maybe LeBron was making twenty million a year. And I was saying, well, LeBron's income, fifty percent of that is tax because mm -hmm. it's based on income. And then his agent, right, right, and his agent, yeah, yeah. all the fees come yeah, down. The, yeah. But then with Mitt Romney, since he was getting two hundred fifty million, or he's getting twenty um, twenty million off of his. Um, Investments, it gets taxed at at at, at, uh, at long term capital gains, mm. right? Because it's 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 income from investments, right? Which you pay twenty percent capital gains taxes on, as opposed to your ordinary income taxes, which you pay at the time about fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So that's really what they do. They get a lot of their income from assets, or if you have, if in the case of real estate, it gets depreciated. So you're not paying, you know, as you know this, you're not paying if you make ten thousand dollars a year in income on that investment property, 
uh, you could depreciate that property so you're not paying taxes on that 10000 You're paying it on far less. So that's really how they live. They live off the income from their assets. And that's what I talk about in my book, how right. to build up you know, how to build up to your be assets. Able to do that. Yeah. And, and that's, it is that, that's attainable. A, yeah, that's the concept people need to have. You don't invest in the stock market just to go buy another Gucci bag or whatever. <laughs> you invest in it because you want to create lifelong income. So you just want to keep yeah, and adding and piling and piling and piling yeah. so that you can live off the income that it produces. And then you can pass that on to your next kid. And then that kid can grow it and they can live off that. And so that's what generational wealth is. It's mm-hmm. like you're building up this base of assets that you use, you pass it to your next uh, uh, family, your heirs, you teach them how to grow it, then they use it, and they keep going on and on and on and on. And you know, it's, it's, the way, it's the game. It feels like you're very into also paying off your mortgages uh, quickly, paying off debt. And I've heard people say, you know, the um, interest rate is so low, you shouldn't even do that. You could use that money to invest into other things. But I've also been a fan of trying to pay off um, mortgages uh, rather quickly like my first house I paid it off in like seven years and then um, one of the houses I have now I actually don't like how much interest they charge because they front load the interest mm-hmm. so I always try to pay it down so that I can at least not be paying you know more than half of the payments are interest and then as you progress it gets a little lower yeah but what are your thoughts on people paying off because some people will tell you just keep the mortgage it's the lowest and you could take that money put it in the stock market and it'll make more for you than you would if you were uh, using that to pay off your mortgage. It just really depends on what kind of cash position you're in. Now, and your personality. And your personality. But I learned this sickness from my German business partners. I had German business partners I talk in the book who paid everything off. And this is like early in my career when German, I learned. The biggest, one of the yeah. biggest cultural things, no debt. Yeah, yeah. It's so all, they, they all did that. They had, yeah. you know, yeah. And so I watched this. Because we say good debt all the time. In Germany, yeah. Yeah. no debt. Yeah. And yeah. I watched this. And I was like, wow. So I started doing this, believe it or not. So... But the other reason is that I had extra cash. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I didn't have cash to continue to do what I wanted to do. And it wasn't all the cash that I had. So if you have to use that extra cash though to invest in something else. That's what I do. Well, well, I'm saying I use my cash and I keep it invested, but I didn't need to use the cash to like all my houses are paid for. Mm -hmm. Um, I live across four houses they're paid for. But they're also fairly modest because I had my big house when I was younger, but then I started getting busy investing and I just didn't really felt like I had to have the need for this big old huge house. Even and it's a lot to maintain it, too. It's a lot to maintain, but it's just really more of, like, I live between Miami, Tampa, Maryland, got places in the Dominican Republic, mm-hmm. their vacation rentals. So I re- I move around so much, I didn't really didn't really have a need for that, although I do plan on building a big family house. I own a four-acre lot uh, where I'm going to build the big family house because I want that to be the place where my grandkids and all that kind of come. And, uh, and realize what I did, <laughs> what I accomplished. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> I mean, another thing you learned from the German invest, um, and partners was to always have a lawyer look over your contracts. Oh, yeah. We cannot stress the importance <sighs> of making sure that when you have an agreement that you have a real attorney who you trust look over those agreements. So, so important. The, the sad part is like I, when I did my first agreement with those guys, and I remember my buddy, I found out he, he passed, is the late Chuck James. I wrote about him. Um, He's the one who told me, he says, Cedric, you always make sure you have, he was one of my millionaire mentors too. I have, I've had many of them. He said, make sure you have a lawyer look over the contract. And so at the time, you know, I was making maybe 65, 70,000 a year working for Deloitte and Touche. And I was like, man, this $5,000. I can't 000, afford a lawyer. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, like, I'm going to take my 5000 You can't afford not to. <laughs> exactly. I had the money, but I was like, I'm going to take 5000 out of my account to pay for this attorney to review it. So glad I did it. Because had I not had them review the contract, had I signed the contract, I would have been tied into a non-compete that would have prevented me from starting my business, which grew to $90 million. Ooh. You get what I'm saying? Yes. It we made get all scared the to let go of money, though. Huh? We get afraid to let we, go we of money. Get afraid, we get afraid sometimes to invest in, in ourselves in ourselves and, in good things. But it's tricky because a lot of hustlers will say, oh, invest in yourself by buying my seminar or buying this. But I'm talking about but like when it's a real business matter. You've got to just... Hot hiring. It's a, one of the best decisions I made and it was I just hadn't done it for so long entrepreneur trying to do everything myself and I'm I couldn't right <laughs> and just bringing in people to help me hiring someone to help me find yeah. clients and yeah. stuff and it was scary totally scary but I learned success is exactly happens at exactly that point and you're willing to do things differently exactly and you exactly. also have to understand that when you make that decision that there's a good chance that it doesn't work out right but that's still not wrong 
That you, you're <laughs> learning who yeah. to hire, who not to hire. Yeah. Exactly. But you still got to do it. It's you always a process. It's always a process. Always. It's a learning process, right? Edu- I mean, entrepreneurship is a is an expensive education, but if you kind of put, keep at it, you learn so much and 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 you build upon that. Well, listen, Cedric, let's talk about this um, Black Wealth Summit because okay. I went to uh, the Black Wealth Summit last year. We had a nice again. Yeah. conversation. So what are the details coming up? Well, this year was going to be October 28th, 29th, mm-hmm. um, and it's going to be 27th, 28th, 29th. It's going to be in uh, Maryland, but we're partnering with the pastor who spoke, is Bishop Joel Peebles, Center of Praise. He's got a 10,000-seat um, uh, uh, sanctuary and we're partnering with them because he's big in the community and we're opening up to members of his church. We're actually doing a Juneteenth event called oh, nice. Your Faith, Your Finances, and Your Freedom. And it's a free event that we're doing at his church. So we're trying to be that community event where we don't charge people a lot of money, but we try to give a lot of content and information. So we're we, our sponsors have been lining up. Morgan Stanley's coming back. You know, Charles Schwab, New York Life. So a lot of them are coming back, and we're we're really excited about building upon this platform and kind of create responsible education for our community. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm in. <laughs> we will be there. About, but I wanted to make sure that you came up here just because I felt like when I came to the Blackwell Summit, there was so much information and so many great relationships that I made. Yes. And I always tell people, you have to, if you're trying to build wealth and, and like you said, set those goals for yourself and be able to comfortably retire and leave something uh, for the next generation. It is important for you to read books, attend summits like these, exactly. have mentors, and you know, take classes. You need those things. Need those things. And and you know, like I said, you know, understand that, you know, you know, becoming a millionaire is not hard, it's just slow. And you have to it's basically not an overnight yeah. Thing. yeah, it's not an overnight thing. And so if it's going slow or you're feeling like you're not you're not going anywhere, it's like that's just how it feels. And right. that was really what I wanted to write in my book is to get people a sense of what it really feels like. You know, when I really kicked off my journey at the age of 25 years old, just what it feels like and, and just keep at it. You'll get What there. is it? It took 30 years to become an overnight success. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, yes. All right. Well, Cedric Nash is way up. Make sure you get the book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Wealth? Where can people find you? They can find me at CedricNash.com or at Millionaire Money Moves uh, on uh, Instagram and Facebook. And pick up the book. I think you'll really, really enjoy it. I mean, it's designed, it's unapologetically targeted to our unique experiences. And the book's rights to our challenges as black people at Building Wealth. And how can people charter this yacht? Oh, they can charter it. (laughs) Go to (laughs) Ecstasy Yacht Charters on Instagram. Come on down to Miami. It's a 60-foot azimuth, three state rooms, and got a banging sound system. I got a great captain, full-time captain, so you have a good time. And you're hiring us as influencers to get you charter. I I (laughs) am. You guys, that's exactly. We get, you know, I got each. us a side hustle. Exactly. Yeah, you get free, you get free, free to it, free charters. <laughs> Don't even say that. For in the this influence, room. you get All free right, charters with the influence. Well, thank you so much, Cedric Nash. Thank, thank you. you. Cedric. Thank you.